So, how many of you have ever eaten insects? Can I have a raise of hands, please? Whoa, okay, that's, that's not what I have expected, that's for sure. Now, more difficult question. How many of you have actually enjoyed eating insects? As in, you don't mind eating them every day, let's say. Raise of hands. No one, okay. <laughs> so I, so just to, for those who haven't seen it, the first question, lots of hands. Second question, I haven't seen anyone. When I first tried eating insects, well, it didn't go so well. I didn't know that you are supposed to remove those little wings from the insects before you put them in your mouth, so they got stuck between my teeth. It was nasty. But the second time I tried eating insects, well, it was horrible, too, to be honest. It, it didn't go well. However, it seems I'm not an exception when it comes to Western also looking here. Uh, Although around the globe, as many as 2 billion people eat insects every day in 113 countries, they eat things like ants, hornets, dung beetles, everything. Among the Westerners, in the countries that traditionally don't eat a lot of insects, excitement is much lower. So only between 13 and 19 percent of people actually admit that they would try eating insects in the first place. Researchers and scientists alike, and business people, are on this quest to find the perfect protein of the future. And insects are just one such idea. So you also have lab-grown meat, you have plant-based proteins, also bleeding plant-based proteins, you have microalgae, seaweed, duckweeds, everything. But can we just stick to eating meat? After all, humans have been eat doing it for two and a half million years. And for most of the time, it was fine. Actually, so much so that scientists now say that for our hominin ancestors, meat actually made us human because it allowed our brains to grow. So what happened? Well, things have changed. First of all, our lifestyles have changed, but also our priorities have changed because for our ancestors, their priority was to keep their stomachs full, right? But for us, and, and for that, meat was great because it kept, you know, it kept them full with the protein, the fat, the calories, the minerals, the vitamins. But for us, we want to live long, at least those of us privileged Westerners, we want to live long, we want to live healthy, we want to have long, healthy retirements. What we don't want is to get heart attacks or diabetes or cancer when we are 50 or 60. But unfortunately, research shows that these are the things that eating a lot of meat, especially red meat and processed meat, is linked with. So things have changed for us. What's more, there is the issue of the burning planet. As much as 14.5% of all human-related greenhouse gas emissions are actually related to livestock production. And if that number doesn't seem so huge, Consider this is about the same as all the transportation combined. So all the cars, trucks, planes, ships, everything together is the same as livestock production. This is huge. And then there are the 80 billion animals that we also kill for meat every year. So obviously, we need a replacement. On paper, insects look great. They're cold-blooded animals, so basically you can say they don't waste energy on living, and they produce a lot of protein. So as much as, for example, crickets, as much as 12 times as much as cattle. 12 times, it's quite a lot. What's more, a lot of species are full of vitamins and minerals, zinc, for instance. They are also often superior to chicken and pork in protein production, so they have more protein than even chicken. And yet, you know, there is this issue of consumer acceptance. Basically, people don't really want to eat insects. In the European Union, mealworm and locust have been allowed for consumption since 2021, and yet you probably don't see them everywhere in restaurants and in stores, precisely because people are not that excited. So maybe microalgae. These are this kind of tiny micro unicellular organisms that are great at producing protein. For example, tetracelmus. It's like this insanely green microalgae that even in cold climates, such as here in the Netherlands, it can produce 300 times more protein than cattle. What's more, it can be grown 
on unused lands, on marginal lands, where nothing else will grow, and even at sea. But the problem with microalgae is that it's, we are still very inefficient at producing it. What's more, it's still very expensive and has this kind of fishy off taste. So it doesn't really taste like meat, to be honest. What does taste like meat is lab-grown meat. I know, I have tried, I actually had a chance this January in Singapore. Uh, I went to the first butcher store in the world that actually sells lab-grown meat alongside, you know, your chicken and pork and, salt and beef. And I had some chicken kebab, chicken fried chicken skin, chicken la Provençale, and it really tasted like meat. And especially for me, I've been vegetarian for 17 years, so that was a huge deal to actually eat meat for the first time. So at least, as far as I remember, it did taste like meat. Singapore is the first country in the world that allows sale of lab-grown meat. Other countries are getting close, for instance, United States, while other countries, such as Italy, are actually considering banning lab-grown meat. Their reason, their reasoning, is that they want to protect their culinary heritage. Well, most likely what they want to protect is their meat industry, but, well. So, why should we eat lab-grown meat to begin with? because it's better for the planet than conventional meat. For instance, it can reduce the greenhouse gut production by 96%. What's more, it requires just a fraction of land, as little as 1% of what you need for conventional meat. But again, there are problems. First of all, there is the price. So in Singapore, I had three tiny, basically this size, chicken kebabs, and they were more or less this wide, and they costed 19 euros, and the price was supposedly kept low, below the costs by the producer, because they want people to actually try and buy the stuff. It's still a huge improvement, because 10 years ago in London, I, I had the pleasure of witnessing the frying of the first lab-grown burger, and then it was this size, or maybe even smaller, and it costed quarter million euros. So we went from quarter million to 19, huge improvement. Still, there is a way to go, because obviously, you know, lab-grown meat requires a lab, meaning high-tech facilities. It's not easily scalable, at least as yet. What doesn't require a lab or high-tech facilities is plant-based meat. All those, you know, impossible burgers, beyond burgers, vegetarian butcher things. But here there are also some issues. So recently, this kind of products, at least some such products, have come under scientific scrutiny because they may not be best for your health, at least some of them. Some of them are okay, but a lot of them are actually very, very processed, meaning they contain a lot of sodium, a lot of saturated fats from palm oil or coconut oil, a lot of flavor enhancers, you know, taste enhancers and binding agents, things you not necessarily want in your food, right? And what's more, when you think about this kind of plant-based products, they are very often burgers. And what do you eat burgers with? fries, with soda, so they encourage this kind of unhealthy eating patterns. Again, not best for you. So do you know what's the simplest solution for the protein of the future? Lentils, beans, tofu, things that we've been already eating for millennia and which are not only simple to make, they're also healthy and good for the planet and cheap. For instance, lentils, are not only low in saturated fats and sodium, but they're also loaded with vitamins, with minerals, with phytonutrients, so things that can actually stave off cancer. Then you have soybeans, which can produce 16 times as much protein as cattle. Beans, 10 times more. You have buckwheat, which in my native Polish cuisine is actually very commonly used, and is as complete in protein as is meat. Exactly the same. So this is amazing. So why do we keep looking for this holy grail of perfect meat replacement? Why do we invest so much money and effort into finding something else than what we already have? Most likely because humans have been hooked on meat for a very long time, probably two and a half million years. And the reasons for that are in part physiological, because we have taste buds that evolved to crave the fat, the protein in meat, but also cultural, because meat, over the years, have become connected with masculinity, with power, with wealth. And then there's some, such a simple reason as lack of cooking skills. So actually, in research, lack of cooking skills is the most common reason for why humans 
why people abandon their vegetarian and vegan diets. And other research shows that the better you are at cooking, the more plant-based you eat, the more veg vegetables and the more fruits. And last but not least, there is money. So for one, there is the meat industry, which obviously doesn't want you to stop buying their products. So they invest a lot in marketing, but also in things such as sponsoring research, for instance. And also for the plant-based industry, the more things are processed, the more they are elaborate. So, you know, plant-based burgers, insect kebabs, the more money there is to be made. In general, this is why we have so much processed food to begin with, because for the industry, the more you process food, the more money there is on it. Simple lentils, basically, are just not good business. So are we going to be eating insects in the future? We may. Most likely, all the proteins they've mentioned, so lab-grown meats, edible insects, microalgae, but also duckweed, seaweed, all the other ideas that are floating around there, will make it to our supermarket shelves and to our restaurants. And this is good. We'll have more choice, we'll have more options. And we need these options because we have to stop eating as much meat as we are doing right now. It's not good for our health, it's not good for the health of our planet. And yet, I still believe that the most powerful proteins of the future are already here. Lentils, beans, tofu, buckwheat. We just have to learn how to cook them. Thank you.